All right. How's it going, everyone? So we got your questions. There are great questions, and there's some really interesting ones in there, too. Um, and I'm excited to go through them with Faz, and um, it's going to be really good having the opportunity to talk with him again and get more of his thoughts and opinions, and especially because some of these questions will actually help me a lot. So I want to just say thank you to everyone for the questions, and is there anything you'd like to say, Faz, before we begin? Yeah, no, thank you again for having me on. Um, really enjoyed the last chat, and uh, this will be a nice training Q&A. Uh, I think it'll be, be cool. Hopefully we can offer the audience some value. Sick, sick. All right, so let's get started. So I think it's kind of funny how over the course of the month, like a lot of these questions eventually just became their own videos. But yeah. it's uh, also cool that we can like kind of, you know, give them a distilled version of it. And then, of course, tell them the, the full answer, which is watch those videos. Because <laughs> yeah. Ian Graham White asks to deadlift or not to deadlift. And I think that's a very interesting um, thing because there's a lot of things to consider. Um, obviously, it's difficult to just like have a blanket answer. And typically, the way you discover if someone knows what they're talking about or not is if they give a one-size-fits-all answer to these kinds of questions. Um, so what are your thoughts, Faz? I know you just had a, a video on this. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... This is a question which um, we were talking about in my little coaching group, and um, I wanted to sort of make a video about it. So I think it's very contextual. Personally, I'm a big fan of deadlifts. I think they're a really good basic hip hinge. So when you're just starting out, you're not going to be able to lift that much weight on, on anything, really, you know, so on any kind of hip hinge. So your good mornings, your RDLs, your hyper extensions, they'll all be really light. So actually, you'll get quite a lot of bang for your buck on just a regular bent leg deadlift, either conventional or sumo style. So what I find is the regular deadlift can be a great start because it lets you lift the most weight. And you get loading. Like stre I think stretch is important, um, but uh, we can't forget loading. So when you're a beginner, you know, we have to pick exercises which actually load stress onto the muscle. So I quite like a deadlift for beginners. And um, I, I mean, I personally find once people get to the point where they are repping about three and a half plates, it becomes problematic. Um, give or take, you know, 40 pounds, right? It becomes problematic and it ends up being such an event. It takes up too much training time during that session. And then that's normally when I move them around. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts and experiences? Yeah, that's about the same with mine. I remember when I was first getting into training, uh, like training myself at least, I will remember a video where it was an Alan Thrall video where he says like, stop deadlifting if you can't do this. And mm -hmm. his essential premise, at least from what I remember is, uh, if you can't properly do your RDLs and your stiff leg deadlifts, then you shouldn't really worry too much about the standard conventional deadlift. And, you know, there, I think there's some uh, validity, validity to that, but it's also, I also can't neglect um, your point of view either, because that's what I did. That's what I did for most of my mm -hmm. training career, because at that point I already was in that, like I was already north of 315. I think I was around that three and a half. And then also for a lot of the people I train, I started out on deadlifts as well. So I don't necessarily think that I'm not like a, there's, there's pages on Instagram that like to make all these like gates and checkpoints that people have yeah. to hit before they can even touch a barbell and just do a deadlift off the floor. Um, but honestly, there are more than enough deadlift tutorials out there that a person who is diligent enough and just willing to uh, actually record themselves and actually like be honest with themselves and audit themselves. They can teach themselves how to deadlift pretty well, absent a coach. Obviously, a coach would be better. So I think most people will benefit from deadlifting. It's just like you mentioned, at a certain point, it just starts It starts becoming um, more of a hindrance. It takes too long. Their, their time could be spent uh, better elsewhere. But when you're a beginner, where else could you spend that time? It's There's not that much other things that you have going for you at that time. Like it's barbells and calisthenics, at least for me. That's what I recommend for most people. Um, and then machines and dumbbells where you can fit them in. All right, so next question comes from Mad Spirit. Um, what's the difference between evolving rep ranges and double progression? So evolving rep ranges, is uh, it sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, yeah. But I think you've been watching a lot of NHS stuff. So uh, how do you kind of like... Uh, sparse that out in your head yeah so i think probably the simplest way to think about it is it's kind of like the difference between triple progression versus double progression i think that's that's the way i would 
pose it just so it's easier to understand. Just if we're trying to compare the two things and look at the differences, um, mm -hmm. a double progression, everybody knows, is um, progressing through increasing either weight or reps. Um, now, when you do evolving rep ranges, um, I think the idea then should be um, introducing that third variable of, of sets. Although, is that, is, that, is that evolving sets? I don't know. Is that yeah, the idea? That's... Is that yeah? I mean, I know I know NH has got his his ideas on it, but um, I think the the method that I talked about recently was kind of my my own method from from back when I was younger, which is maybe maybe more relevant to what he's asking. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Am I off, am I on the right track there? Or am I? Right? I think am you I, are I'm... because I I've <laughs> I've spent uh, met a lot of time like vacuuming the gym, <laughs> listening to that playlist of that evolving rep range just to kind of make mm -hmm. sense of it. But that that sounds right to me. Mm -hmm. Because he does say that the final evolution of evolving rep ranges is to add sets. So I'm just like... Okay, so yeah, maybe I'm off on the wrong track there. I think evolving sets is probably then triple progression. Evolving rep ranges, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not actually massively familiar with what NH has said on that. So that might be something that you can answer more confidently. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, I'm very confident when I'm wrong. So, <laughs> uh, so as far as like... <laughs> so as far as... Um, evolving rep ranges and how it kind of made sense to me is that i think there's been a lot of discussion on his channel where um, he even says that it is essentially a another form of double progression um so the thing that kind of gets stuck in my head is that when i hear evolving rep ranges intuitively i think that the rep ranges should change so you start in the five to eight rep range and then you move maybe like six to ten or something like that um however uh looking at most of his videos i don't necessarily think that's the case and if that does happen it's really far down the line where you as you get really really strong with a certain like exercise maybe you spend most of your time in that six to ten but now you're really, really strong and it's really difficult to add uh, reps in that rep range. Then you'd go into that five to eight. So it's kind of like almost like that um, phase potentiation that strength um, enthusiasts use in their training. However, they're just done on a much longer time frame because a strength enthusiast or a power lifter or a strong man, they have um, a certain block of time where and they're trying to use a bit more of that linear periodization. So they ha they expect to make these jumps in a couple weeks, like one to two weeks or maybe um, a bit more. Whereas for someone who is a bit more hypertrophy focused, they would do that over months and they do that as a need rather than um, part of their actual like programming plan. Uh, so that's I guess that's where that that part of the evolving rep range kind of comes in. However, there is also that other aspect where once you do hit that rep range, rather than adding weight immediately, you give yourself more time to actually acclimate to that weight by increasing the number of sets. So let's say you're doing three sets of five to eight. You you're doing on the first week you do five five five, then you do like uh, seven six five, and then you do eight seven five or something like that. Before you even uh, add weight, you um add another set first or even if or if, i think that's kind of how he goes about it because i don't think he actually waits until you hit three sets of eight because he thinks that's at that point in time you already hit hit a amount of strength that takes that further from failure so adding in that extra set would actually give you more of those reps closer to failure at least that's how i understand his okay. evolving rep range method Okay, I, I'm I'm hoping that I might actually get him onto the channel at some point. We've discussed it, so perhaps I'll get him to expand on on what it is more precisely and sort of nail him down to, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, cool. Apparently, I need to read up on it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, interesting and like he has a whole playlist on it and. Um, honestly, like most of the time he's shirtless in it, so it's kind of difficult to focus. Uh, <laughs> I mean, but, credit to him. He does a great job because it's not his first language. So, you know, he does a fantastic too. job mm -hmm. in, considering the language barriers. So that's really good. But no, the, um, in terms of the way that I've explained my own method, which is people have said it's quite similar to evolving rep ranges or evolving sets, is mm -hmm. I call it owning the weight. So this is the kind of the way that I was explained. And the idea is you build volume at a certain weight, which allows you to have small minute progressions before you jump up because very often if you're going up by five pounds it can be a crushing amount of weight so the idea is you own the weight and you add certain sets certain reps within a range once you've maxed out that range then you're going to be more comfortable and be able to go up which um is useful for for any advanced progression because or intermediate progression because it just helps to smooth out the uh, progressions between large jumps or even small jumps jumps can be quite jagged 
And so it just helps you to build up that volume. And I find as soon as people hit their first kind of beginner plateau, I'll put them on something like that. And it just helps to smooth out the progression a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Something that um, has helped me a lot recently is uh, most people make like, you know, if you do the math on it, like a 4% jump every session, but it's from session to session. So from a Monday to another Monday. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for quite a while because my style of training was like a volume day intensity day. So the intensity days and the volume days, like they kind of, they do move up in the same direction, but asynchronously. Um, whereas now I don't really do that so much. So if I'm trying to make a 4% jump each week, which, you know, is about that like five, 10, uh, five, 10 pound number. Um, I actually split that up over two sessions. So mm -hmm. one session will be 270. The next session will be two, um, like 275. And, and then so that way, when I have to hit 280 in the next week, rather than jumping from 270 to 280, I am able to have that intermediate session that kind of helps uh, do that. Uh, there's one talking point that I kind of want to get your thoughts on that this question made me think of. And it's one where like strength coaches in um, a specific sphere of YouTube really love appealing to the Russians. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there is there is at least one interesting talking point that um, I, I would like your uh, knowledge on, which is that the the Russian model acknowledges that we don't fully know how long it takes the body to recover. And as a result, it undulates things like way more to kind of accommodate for that. Um, what are your thoughts on that and how how relevant it actually is that to like the overall discussion? Because I think most training systems don't actually like appeal to that kind of reasoning no yeah they don't they don't no yeah i think it's i think there's a lot to be said for that and that sort of is quite reminiscent of my own the weight type of philosophy um so i think what the russians did have going for them is they were a lot more in tune with their athletes so if a coach saw that somebody didn't have it on the day then they could reduce the boundaries for where they would lift or, or if they were feeling really good increase them so there was that little degree of flexibility allowed within the program and I think this is one of those cases where for the general population, it's important to remember that once you're past that beginner stage, poundage progression needs to be uh, realistic and there needs to be a realistic assessment of what you're capable of. Because I think just like fat loss, people get very used to quick gains. And so when you're largely sort of at the beginning of the diet, your, your fat's going to come off a lot faster. Now, I think one of the reasons that people don't really get very lean is because they don't have the patients to acknowledge what is actual true rates of fat loss just like when people go past the beginner stage of training they don't really acknowledge what is true rates of strength gain and they, they consider it a they consider it a uh, a defeat a failure if they're only able to go up by five pounds a month whereas you and i know that's a more realistic rate of strength progression if you're really pushing your limits whereas if you and i were to gain 10 pounds a session or five pounds a session it's mm we're either going to be following a, a, a linear plan like you described earlier, or mm. basically we're just kind of building up in weights and we're not really at the point where we're working maximally yet. So I think one of the real key benefits to this uh, question, like the evolving rep ranges and the more complex progression systems is that it smooths out and slows down the progression to be more realistic. And I think it's an important note to bear in mind because the amount of clients that I have to talk to when they first arrive to just tell them, well, actually, you know, five pounds a month on a lift is probably very realistic progression. And if mm. you do that for 10 months, that's 50 pounds, which is incredible. And realistically, you might not even gain that. So more like two and a half pounds per month is, is very good. So this is why when you have these um, evolving set ranges, owning the weight, all these kinds of things, they tend to help that. Um, to, they tend to allow you to have a more realistic rate of progression, but still get the sort of endorphin rush and like acknowledgement that you are improving. Um, yeah, I think people get dissatisfied with their rate of progress. Then they attempt mm. to make changes. They go for uh, they change the routine. They have to start over again, and mm -hmm. they never really get to the point where they're in that grinding zone where they really grind the lifts and really see a genuine five pounds a month or two and a half pounds a month of actual progress. I don't think a lot of people are really comfortable with that rate of progress, and as a result, they never really make it past that intermediate stage. Um, that that's kind of my thoughts on i guess and it relating to your the question about the russians i think with that they just allow a little bit more flexibility within that week to week for that really slow rate of progression yeah yeah and i think uh at least it, it comes to my head that that's why i at least like a more block approach to training mm -hmm. especially for myself and my clients is because i have these you know 
arbitrary as they are, checkpoints throughout that um, whatever time frame I have, where it's just like, all right, uh, we can compare this point in time to the previous block, or um, we've accumulated a lot of work, and then we can make some inferences and kind of guess like where we're heading, where we're going, and things of that nature. And I think people, their scope is the session only. They don't have that like more long term approach to it because, at least for myself. If I hit a five uh, pound PR every 10 weeks, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. So um, me when those uh, bad workouts kind of happen throughout the training block, I also recognize that, you know, recovery might take a hit, stress might um, have something to do with this and all the hard work I'm putting in, it's not going nowhere. Like mm. even if the session itself isn't as good as I want it to be, um, the hard work that I'm putting in is not going nowhere. And like all the other aspects outside the gym are also going to help carry forward into uh, PR at the end of the block. And sometimes um, you think it won't happen, but like I said, if you just focus on, you know, actually doing your um, best um, for what's there that day, you will hit that PR. So I think that's something that a lot of people need to learn as, and that's something I really like have to like try to teach to all of my clients as well, that, don't get sidetracked into thinking that this bad workout has undone all your hard work and will like somehow limit the amount of benefit you get from the rest of the workouts like in the future. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Next question uh, comes from Mohammed Nas. How to mm. recomp, whether it's viable or not, who's it for, and when it's just spinning your wheels. So uh, I do want to get your like thoughts first, but I just want to say one thing when it comes to recomping. Um, it's not a recomp if you don't like 100% fix your food quality. Like yeah. I think that is the first thing that people need to understand with any type of diet. A recomp is still a diet. Like as much as on paper, if it fits your macros and whatnot, works really, really well. Just because of like my experiences recomping for years essentially, um, which is just, uh, most people will call, like say it's a recomp, but really it's just a failed cut. Um, mm. Like, there's no secrets to dieting. It's all always going to be quality and consistency. Like the most amount of weight that I've ever lost were just a result of those two factors. And trying to loop around that is what keeps you spinning your wheels. Like, um, so that's just how been my experience. I would like to hear yours a lot more like developed. Yeah, no, I really like that. I mean, just to sort of probe you a bit more on that, um, Giggity, um, with regards to like, cause currently you're cutting, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever had an extended period of time, like six months or so where you've, or a year where you've recomped and specifically just sort of stayed at one body weight? And what was your experience of that yourself? So is that something you've done? Yeah. Yeah. I've gone through, um, a pretty decent amount of cuts. The thing is like most of the time, the thing is like, I don't think it like now that I've like taken a step back and with the thought process about it, I don't think it was a crash diet. Mm -hmm. I think it was just more so I didn't, reverse diet my way into healthy eating like i just went back to really bad habits like the act so for quite a while i would say like oh i didn't diet properly and then i started to realize like no i actually did diet properly i got rid of the bad foods in my diet i ate more healthful foods i maintained my activity and or increased my activity and as a result i lost the weight so that's a success yeah. what was a failure was the part after that i just added all of that back in all at once. Mm -hmm. So um, I like, so let's see, there's a couple cuts that I did in the military. One of them was like a dreamer cut essentially, because it was when I think about it, I was like, damn, like to be 18 again, um, because I was, I ballooned back up to a fat 270, like not a buff 270. Cause I was trying to eat my way out the army. Cause it was just, you know, I was a young kid, no mentorship. Like, um, and I was alone for the first time in my life. Right. I get home one day, I start realizing just how much I hate looking at myself in the mirror. And I was like, I'm not going out like this. As much as I hate the military, I'm not going to get out of it this way. So um, I had to lose like 70 pounds in three months or else they would just like kick me out. So um, yeah, I was going on like one meal a day every other day um, just to really cut down on that weight. And, you know, I was able to do it, spend a couple more years in the military and when I did finally lose that weight, rather than like slowly reintroducing back calories, re slowly reintroducing back a healthy meal plan, I just started binging again. Yeah. So um, that's 
I, I think I answered my question or your, your question somewhere in there. <laughs> but yeah, that was yeah. like uh, one of my experiences. And then as far as like being able to maintain a weight, the most that I was able to maintain it was around like that 230 number or that 220, 230 number for an extended amount of time. But it was I was only able to maintain it by um not only, but I maintained it by horrible means as well. I basically just had these horrible dietary habits throughout the week and then a binge on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And then just like just mathematically like can't like canceled each other out to be like I'm 220, 230. So yeah. horrible, uh, not the losing weight part, but just maintain, maintaining that part. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said identified there is is a problem with a lot of dieters. And, um, you know, credit to you for talking about it, because I think a lot of people would be uh, would, would be hesitant to talk about it. But I think, like you said, the diet definitely works. Um, but it's, it's the reintroduction to regular eating and maintenance eating afterwards. I've talked about this quite a lot on, on my channel, and that is um, this idea of teaching people how to eat to live. And... Everyone's, everyone's great at dieting. Everyone's great at just like dieting and then going all out afterwards. But it's that intermediate phase of maintenance, which I think needs a lot of coaching and a lot of dieting. So I do employ some extreme diet methods with some clients, but they're always a base for then adding further foods on. Like I've just got a client, um, Steve, who's just finished a 30 pound cut. He's done really well and we did it relatively fast. And what we were doing now is I'm sort of teaching him how to eat to live and that is the reintroduction slowly of certain foods in the beginning it's just increasing portions of diet foods so we're really not even changing the types of foods he's still sort of locked into this fairly narrow range of of diet foods but yeah it's a big thing i think it's the fast cuts are fine um the extreme cuts are fine or, or regular cuts whatever suits you uh, whatever's appropriate for you but what we need to identify is the maintenance diet afterwards and the reintroduction of food and that whole eating to live kind of thing which i think is super important now that's different to what this lad's talking about which is mm -hmm. you know recomp right now we're talking about how to do effective dieting um but, but I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that you need to practice maintenance at some point and i think ideally what would be good is to take a diet break when you're in the middle of a cut maybe a couple of times or at least once and just practice eating at maintenance for a couple of weeks because if you can't maintain let's say you have a 50 pound weight loss journey if you can't practice the maintenance at steps along the way mm -hmm. then you're never going to be able what what makes you think you'll be able to maintain when you're 50 pounds down if you haven't practiced yet alongside all the increased hunger all the sort of increased hormonal drive to eat which comes from having lost all that weight so yeah i'm a big believer in taking those little steps along the way to pause and as soon as somebody starts to show any signs of diet fatigue i think okay great we can take this as an opportunity to say, right, not only are we going to alleviate some diet fatigue, but we're also going to practice how to eat for maintenance, which is going to set you up for an even better time once you finish the diet. And I think that has had a lot of success with, with clients that I've, that I've coached in the past, particularly with like large weight loss transformations. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's something which I'm a big believer in. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't answered the question yet, have we? So uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think, I, I honestly i feel like that is how to r almost recomp as well like it's just learning that maintenance because um in my opinion or obviously there's like there is that difference and we'll talk about that but when you do learn how to have that healthful diet where you're eating mostly healthy foods all the time i think most people really underestimate just how much bad things they're putting in like bad like, oh I'm yeah not sure. yeah totally. Like, totally they totally underestimate it and um i made a post recently where i told people like the biggest, the, the best way for big people like myself, so 250 and above, to get better at pull-ups is to just eat more vegetables. Because if you <laughs> like start... <laughs> That's like, great. I like that. Because if you just start improving the diet quality, you're going to notice and like and not really starting to do portion sizes quite yet, just quality first, right? You're going to start to notice that you do feel better. You do um, like you're more satiated, but you're also not bloated. Um, and then also your muscles work better, your blood flows better and everything like that. So as a result, you're getting all these better results in the gym and these things kind of feed into one another. So I just think that when it comes to recomping, if you clean up the diet, your performance in the gym improves. And then if your performance in the gym improves, you want to do, you want to give more attention to your diet. 
and you want to uh, make sure that both things are going well because you're starting to notice just how much they play into one another. And as a result, that becomes that goes from a recomp into like, let's say, like, I don't know, a mini cut, but it's just like not really done with that intention, I guess. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of like where my thought process is right now. But I would love to hear yours. Yeah, I think I think it's um, people always um, hate on like vlogs and eating mm. days and stuff like that, you know, day of eating mm. um, as really cheap content. But actually people it, people really enjoy it because it's what you were saying about people don't appreciate how much crap they're putting into their bodies. I think it's a lot, a lot of times it's a lack of education. It's a lack of knowing what to do. So I'm not great at showing my own life to, as much to YouTube as I should be um, because people like to see it. They like to see, well, what are you actually eating, Faz? Or how are you actually training? And I think it's a valid question. So I am going to try and do more of that because I'd like to show people, well, here's a regular day of eating. Like, this is what I eat. Like, I just finished eating um, a couple of pork loins with about 400 grams of vegetables. Like, that is a pretty typical summer meal for me because I like my food a little bit lighter in the summer. So it's more mm. salady and stuff like that. But mm. like to show people, like, this is what a reasonable meal looks like, I think is a good idea. And um, I'd like to, I should be doing more of that. So I think it's kind of useful. Um, but yeah, I think people just don't really understand because they need to, to, to be shown. We can mm. talk about it all we like, but I think people like to, to see. It's just mm -hmm. like training intensity. We can mm -hmm. talk about it all we like, but it's, it's nice to show people, hey, this is how we train. So mm -hmm. it's something I, I plan to do more of, I think. Yeah. And just uh, before we move on to the next question, like, so I just had, um, over the past week, I was uh, with my friend's family for like a family reunion and like they were invited friends over and whatnot. And I am the biggest person in most groups I'm in, like, you know, uh, and I didn't really understand what a normal person's portion size was. <laughs> until right. i started yeah. hanging around more normal people mm -hmm. like they don't they don't lift they don't exercise they don't do anything like they just eat appropriately and they maintain like a healthy body weight that is all what they a do terrible life yeah <laughs> for real i was like what what do you do with all that extra time like <laughs> uh, like don't the voices in your head just start like <laughs> becoming too much no self hatred <laughs> at all like oh, how's this possible like <laughs> is it possible to learn this power like <laughs> uh, yeah no definitely i oh, by the way before we move on to this lad here mohammed nas i think i know him um because he's mentioned it in comments before he doesn't need to recomp he is far too underweight he needs to gain weight so mm. mohammed you do not need to recomp you need to gain weight um so it's not viable for you. You are underweight. Gain some weight. Um, now, in terms of just to wrap up and finish the actual question, I think when it's viable is if you can still progress in terms of your weights in the gym and your poundage while you're maintaining your weight, I think it's reasonable to recomp. I think it's okay. Um, obviously, if you're very lean, you're not going to get very far doing that. If you are working in true bodybuilding ranges, um, I think if you're, if you're working for strength, maybe you can see some minor improvements. But... I think the cutoff is probably 15% body fat. You know, I think if you'd agree with mm -hmm. that, um, any lighter than that, really, I don't think it's worth it. Um, yeah. And I think that's roughly where NH finished his three-year recomp was about 15% because he had sort of abs when he was tense, good thing. So, um, yeah, it's 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 something which is can be viable for a lot of people. Um, like I have a lot of clients who would do just fine doing a recomp. Um, but if you are on the lighter side, on the leaner side, it's not something you should be doing bulk. Like like Paris Butler says, like Bolt says, Bolt Omni Man says, just bulk, you know, bulk. Like mm. it's 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 good. Like enjoy your food and, and start training, especially if you're underweight. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like the conversation around maintenance. It's um it's a good talk. Yeah, definitely. Mm. All right. So next question. Uh this one's from MD and I mm. I'm not sure how to pronounce the rest of that. Uh, what have you guys changed your mind on in the past year? Uh, for me, power building. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> Got to. Gloves are off. <laughs> Gloves are off. It's like, you son of a... <laughs> 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 but yeah, what is something that uh, you changed your mind on, fast? Oh, man, a lot, a lot. Um, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm actually, I've, this is a video which is going to be out soon. Mm. So I've been experimenting personally and also with some clients on certain like rules of lifting and we've been breaking them. Um, mm. So something that I kind of refer to as, as I've been thinking about it, I've been talking about it in the, the coaching group and I've identified it as the four R's. Mm. So um, reps, rest periods, RAR and range of motion. Mm. Now, a big thing I've been, I've changed my mind on is 
all four of those things over mm. i would say the last year but really the last few years as i've been experimenting more and more with those things and this idea that everyone's always pushing for in this day and age like maximum rom maximum training intensity maximum volume all those kind of things and you lump everything together and it ends up being for some people quite injurious and it's mm. not something people can necessarily maintain all the time and i think we have these maxims which people um, try and box themselves into and as a result sometimes they end up getting hurt because maybe they aren't able to do full range of motion over a long period of time with a lot of volume with a lot of training intensity without getting hurt mm -hmm. and i've known guys who have pushed like things like the stiff leg deadlift um, with a heavy amount of volume with a full range of motion really stretching all the way out and have just ended up snapping up their snapping the shit up mm -hmm. and so what i've been experimenting with is actually playing around with all those things. So using repetition ranges, which are far higher than I would normally use, like in the 20 range, 25 range. Mm. I've also experimented with, don't cancel me for this, but like reducing my range of motion on exercises specifically. You know, like the old um, Ronnie Coleman training style, touching the chest on mm. a bench press and going about halfway. Um, finding that has helped my shoulder. I've also experimented with some clients who have reduced rest periods quite considerably to the point where it would be seen to be not optimal, but it allows these guys to train hard and stay in the gym because if they're resting, let's say, to give you an example, 45 seconds between sets, which is hardly any time at all, mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're making up for, they're making up for the weight on the bar with the workout density and they're still able to train hard, maybe not ideal amount of uh, amount of intensity on the as weight on the bar or rest periods, but it allows them to stay in the gym and still mm -hmm. gain some benefits and build some muscle. Um, and yes, yeah, so rest periods range of, and also RAR not, I've also experimented with certain clients of not trained to failure because, yeah. because it, again, it, we do, you do get more benefit from going to failure. Um, but for a lot of people that can be quite injurious. So yeah, I mean, those are four things that I've changed my mind on this year. I've stopped being quite as dogmatic on those things and saying that everyone has to do those because and I'll, I'll explain this fully in a video. I just think um, if if we if we if you're consistently sort of getting hurt, getting injured, getting aches and pains by doing those things, it means you're going to spend more time out of the gym. So if you are, for example, forced to go ass to grass on your squats because otherwise you'll just get humiliated on social media whenever you put something up, but mm. it hurts you to do so, then that's not good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're trying to progress with your weights and you've been told you have to do 10 to 20 sets but actually you're progressing just fine on eight then just do eight the 20 sets i know you're enthusiastic i know you really want to gain and i know you want to do all the right things and i know you've been told 10 to 20 sets is a standard but you don't have to do 20. and i think i've been pulling back on a lot of those things as i coach more people um i tend to see that those four factors can really be played around with because hypertrophy is a very forgiving endeavor as long mm -hmm. as you work hard, then you're good. But mm -hmm. you're not going to work hard if you're just continuously injured. So, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, I mean, there's so much. As you, you, you'll be the same, Corellis. As you coach more and more, like in real life, you will change your mind on a ton of things. I mean, there's there's more I could say as well, but those are just four that I sprung to mind because I'm doing a video on them soon. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's like I'm not sure if like there have been like as drastic changes in my approach. Like, um, I would say. For me, I'm <laughs> I'm a very much like reject modernity, embrace tradition kind of guy. <laughs> so nice. like, but at the same time, like I've also like you know, as you mentioned, the more people you coach, the more you have to modify things. The more you realize like people really don't fit into these molds. Like, mm. um, you know, people who have that you know traditional mindset, they they want to they they fall too heavily into like you're not a special snowflake kind of idea, and most people aren't. Like, like, and in most ways people aren't, but there's going to be those nuances and like those small deviations where, no, you should treat them as like different than the uh, common way of going about things. And for me, I guess like the biggest change in uh, my mind is in very similar to yours, it's those uh, range of motion differences and then also mm -hmm. exercise selection. I'm way mm -hmm. more forgiving with exercise selection. For me, it's just so long as like a reasonable exercise is fulfilling a specific role as long as that's being done, I don't care if it's a barbell bench, a machine bench, a Smith machine, like it doesn't really matter. And 
so long as you're getting the result that you want. If you are, if I'm coaching someone and they disclose to me that this is what I want, like just for example, with that uh, chest size, if we are making progress, if we are like reasonably seeing improvement, then it's like, all right, cool. This slot is being satisfied. I don't need to worry about it too long or too much. That is totally fine. And then same thing with like the whole range of motion aspect as well. Some people I train, they do have a injury history that is far mm-hmm. worse than my own. So it's, as a result, it's incredibly irresponsible if I try to force them to have a form that makes me feel good about myself or something. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are clients who they ex- they exclusively do like spoto pressing, for example. And mm-hmm. the where they're at in um, the world, some people look at them and say like, "You're not training properly." Like, and they message me like every couple of weeks, like, "Hey, the trainer at my gym uh, came up to me again and said yes. I'm not doing this right." Mm-hmm. Or and I'm just like, "Hey, man, <laughs> like, uh, like this is what we've done. This is the progress you're making. Mm-hmm. I think we're doing things. Things okay." Mm-hmm. Um, so that's some things because like i remember when i was younger i would look at people who are half repping uh whether they're squats their presses or whatever and i'm just like these dumbasses but then i would fail yeah. to um appreciate that they're actually lifting like way more than me and they're way bigger than me <laughs> so yeah. uh, that was like young me so like uh, but yeah in the past year like range of motion and like exercise selection are, i would say like the, probably the two biggest things that have changed the that's most. awesome that's really cool yeah i mean i think one from a, a dieting point of view is mm. This is not the last year, but this is probably the last few years. Um, I've changed my mind over uh, there being a preferred way of eating. So I'm mm. a lot of people who watch my videos will be familiar with my habit-based intuitive style of eating. But, but actually, I don't think that's the best way for everyone. You know, mm. I, I, don't, I think it's one of three broad ways which you can use. And I, th- and I teach all three ways to, to my clients. And it depends what's appropriate for them. And I think we can often think that diet history and diet culture is just progressing towards a peak, you know, like like evolving towards like a perfect diet. So mm. we've gone through the phase of meal planning. We've gone through the phase of if it fits your macros, we're now in the habit-based approach. And it's almost like there's this progression. And I do think, I do feel some coaches who are very short-sighted, they sell habit-based eating like that because they're not aware of the role of trends in mm. in fitness. I think across 20 years, those three methods are valid for different individuals. Like right now, I don't track calories. I don't have a meal plan. I'm more of an intuitive eater. But there are situations where I might do better with a meal plan. Also, different clients will do better with different approaches. As a broad general guideline, I found people who come from very restrictive eating backgrounds, um, like potentially sort of potentially eating the sort of type of issues, like more along the lines of, anorexia and bulimia as as they recover they tend to do better with still a little bit more control numerically so macros and calories that's what i found with those i think people who have over ate quite a lot in the past like i have they tend to do better with habit-based approach because it is a little bit more flexible and it gives them that structure or even Mm. meal plans like i've done quite well on meal plan approach Um, i quite like it because it gives me a lot of good structure Mm. so it depends on what you need to still allow you to progress. If you've been overly restrictive, just doing macros and calories will allow you to loosen up a little bit. And you and I might consider that to be really restrictive year round. But for people who have come from that very restrictive background, you know, macros and calories is, is living the dream. It's that classic, mm. oh, I get to eat an ice cream after lunch and I, I yeah. count it. For you and me, it's like, hell no, I'm eating the tub. So like, move out <laughs> of the way, skinny. Like, yeah, I've got right. this, you know. <laughs> but um, it's like, I'll eat you too if you stay in my way too long. <laughs> <laughs> right. you got five seconds. I'm not going to run after you, but. <laughs> like, so, right. yeah. yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's definitely variable. So I've changed my mind on, because back, back, back in the day, I used to be a bit more, into the macros and calories and be determined that was kind of better for everyone uh, or maybe the habit-based approach and kind of like poo-pooing the meal plans but, mm. but no actually i think those three broad categories the meal plans the macros and calories and the habit-based approach they have they're, they're appropriate for different people so i don't think we're evolving mm. uh, as much as we are uncovering different options for different people which i think is more valuable oh 100 um, yeah. yeah i, like I that mean there's this this is a great question because there's so much yeah. mm-hmm. Definitely. Next question comes from Paladin Dance. What is the biggest thing you think is underrated when it comes to building muscle and what is overrated? Um, there's This is something that uh, 
I think people have put into words very poorly, honestly, but I do appreciate um, their vigor with this argument. And it is like essentially being dogmatic about very arbitrary things. And look at Yes. Like, <laughs> honestly, I do think that for hypertrophy in particular, it's actually pretty good because when I was going through like my first initial bout of like resistance training, right? I've like as arbitrary as it was chicken, broccoli, rice, you know, like I didn't really think too much into um, whatnot, uh, all that. It's very micro uh, nutrient deficient, quite honestly, because like there's not that much variety and things of that nature. Yeah. However, like we've kind of talked about, hypertrophy is a very forgiving endeavor and you can build an appreciable amount of muscle in a micro deficient state. Whereas I do think that strength is way more, uh, the micros are way more important for strength. However, like obviously if you want the best results, yeah, have you need to be very micro oriented as well but many people in their attempt to find the right diet because many people are like should i bulk should i cut um should i recomp or and then after you kind of have them an answer well what should i eat when i bulk what should i eat when i cut what should i eat when i recomp and then it's like well what about this thing what about this thing and that's kind of where that analysis by per, uh, paralysis sets in but if you kind of just think to yourself all right chicken rice bro broccoli like that's going to be like 80 percent of my meals most of the time i'm and then they just like kill it absolutely kill it in the gym and they modify their intake based on how they're feeling they're going to build a lot of muscle so i 100 uh think that it's very worthwhile to kind of have that arbitrary um dogmatic consistency with things and you rather than like like letting more things in rather than like opening the floodgates and just like letting whatever happen like i think that approach is like really useful for uh, building muscle and i think that's going that's why people will always say like that's better than being optimal and that's why i'll kind yeah. of say like for the overrated answer it's like trying to be optimal it's like you haven't even nailed down consistency yet what is there to optimize like uh something that i've been doing with my diet is strictly for a while it was just food quality i did not care about my portion size i was like i'm just going to improve what i eat so i mm. cut out a lot of like junk foods i caught out a lot of processed foods and i expanded my definition of processed foods to include food that was made for me so that means eating out like like uh, even if it's like something healthy like chipotle uh, or like there's other like healthy options available around me i still consider it a processed food because it was not made by me and simply trying to improve the amount of foods or the amount of meals that i myself make has done a lot even though the actual portion sizes are about the same and um, as a result just having this arbitrary dedication to excluding some foods and others it's not that i'm excluding them because they're bad it's just like um i just not finding value in them right now so um if someone were to press me on like exactly why i take them out my diet it would just be because it just makes sense for me like it would like uh as simple as that and then kind of taking it um out further i'm expecting it to like have these better gains you know make me happy at the end of it and some people they need to have these reasons backed by science or a large group of people that they respect in order for them to feel comfortable in their decision making and that will just always keep a person small and not making progress in my opinion yeah yeah, yeah. no yeah love it um i think i think mine is probably like an extension to the previous question um coming at this from the perspective of somebody now who's been in the gym for almost two and a half decades, I think. And, you know, just people who I've known who have started the gym about the same time I did was the underrated thing is just whatever allows you to stay in the gym. Um, mm -hmm. and like I've been doing these experiments with different training modalities, experimenting with the rules of lifting to allow me to stay in the gym, train pain free and just keep getting in the gym. I think that's super important. Um, because I think once you get to a point where you've you've been in the gym, for, I think more, most of us are hopefully going to be doing this for a lifetime. You know, we're going to be training way past our peaks for different reasons, for health, all that kind of stuff. Whatever allows us to stay in the gym, and if that looks very different from what is optimal, then that's okay. Also, if it's just motivational for us, that's good mm. too. Uh, like there are certain rules, like don't don't let your lifting be your cardio, for example. Like mm. train hard and heavy. Don't train fast. Those rules can be broken. I mean, I wrote a whole ebook on it, the um, the Ocelot book. Mm. So, 
I think underrated is just whatever allows you to keep turning up to the gym. Because what I've seen is the guys who are my age, who've just stopped going to the gym, their condition does deteriorate quite rapidly. Like unless you're, unless you're taking drugs and stuff um, like TRT or whatever, your, your muscle mass is going to start to rapidly decline in your forties and fifties. Um, it's not, it's not something you can maintain without a degree of training. Whereas when you're younger, I think it's just, for me anyway, it was a little bit easier. I didn't lose that much when I went for those six months backpacking around Asia. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think just staying in the gym, I think is super, super important um, because you have to, you also end up just not, you lose the capability to do things, I think a lot quicker. Like I, I'm not that great at running. Um mm. One thing I encourage people to do if they can run is just to maintain that ability. Like I know you do martial arts and you run too. Like just always keep your hand in those, you know, mm. never get to the point where you're, you've spent a year and you've not seriously ran because as you get older, you'll lose the ability and it just becomes harder to get it back. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just try and keep a hand in on the good physical things you're able to do because mobility is super important the older you get and just the difference between physical decline and maintenance when you're older is just practice and staying in the gym um so that i think is just underrated in mm. terms of what's overrated i think probably a lot of the minutiae that we talk about you know um <laughs> like if you think about it all of us guys like yourself um landon from basement bodybuilding just to shout out a few people here um paris butler bald omni man alpha destiny um alex leonidas um all, all the good guys i think we all have our takes on a natural hypertrophy, we all have our takes on certain things, where we like to do things in terms of sets and reps, um, how we like to do splits. But the reality is we all have the basics covered. We're all, we are the 1% of fitness and the 99% is the BS workouts, the mm. nonsense, the fads, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think overrated is all the minor details that we may have differing opinions on. Um, whereas the, the bulk of what we all say, like progressive overload, make sure you're, you know, and all these things, that's all very positive. The, the rough, broad volume guidelines we have, we might argue about failure versus not failure, but the reality is we agree on more things than we don't. And I think that's important to remember in our little community, because for a lot of the guys who are on your channel, the comments who comment on your channel, they also comment on mine, vice versa. And mm -hmm. I think if you're in that circle, you're good. Like you're mm -hmm. there, you're sorted. You've, you've gotten away from the Greg Doucettes and whatnot, and you're, you're good now. So yeah, I think, um, I think that's just something to, to bear in mind. I think the most overrated is, is a lot of the, the minor details really. No, oh, definitely. And while you're mentioned, uh, while you're talking, something that I want to add before I move on is, uh, well, I man actually had a video on this and I think something that's incredibly underrated is passion. Like just being like highly motivated. Like people want to shit on motivation all the time. Yeah. And I, but I mean like all of us, like the people that you've mentioned, we have gone through a phase in our life where we were just running almost exclusively on motivation. Like, um, you know, you can talk about it as many, in many different ways, but some people think that you have to like embrace the suck essentially, which is mm -hmm. like, you know, s like struggle your way through it and whatnot. But for many of us who have reached our level of like size, strength and whatnot, it wasn't necessarily a struggle because we actually enjoyed it so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, something that is very weird because people, I guess, uh, I think they're masochistic. They they um, really take pride in how much they torture themselves and pick themselves up when they don't want to, force mm -hmm. themselves to go to the gym and work really hard when they don't want to. And it's just like, you didn't want to do that? Like, for, at least that's how I would, um, like, trying to put myself back into my younger days, uh, which I'm, you know, I'm still very young. But when I was, like, that 18, early 20s, I was, I would just think, like, what else is there for this, for my day? Like, what else would I want to do? Why wouldn't I want to be here? Why wouldn't I want to be, like, lifting this weight? Why wouldn't I want to be, like, doing pull-ups? Like, what's so good out there that's, like, better than this? Like, I think many of us have gone through that. And I think now it's almost as if that's, not necessarily taught or rewarded yeah. or like emphasized or something of that nature and the people who do stick it out obviously they're disciplined but why are they disciplined you can say it's because of motivation and whatnot and i think that's incredibly useful to many people trying to build muscle so um when it comes to something being underrated 
being motivated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I put the I put the blame squarely at the uh, the feet of the motivational um, kind of thought process. You know, the motivation guys on on YouTube, like the um, the Jocko Willinks, the self help guys, mm. Jocko Willinks, the Andrew Hubermans, all that kind of stuff. I put the the blame squarely on the feet of those people, the uh, mm. the Goggins and all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's they just tend to have these catchphrases which become cliches after a while and people take them really seriously. I mm. think their intentions, like Goggins, I think his intentions are positive. You know, mm. I think he wants to help people, but but yeah, like he talks a lot about these sort of buzzwords like discipline, motivation, all that stuff. Mm. And I think, yeah, you know, it's a combination of, of everything. It, it was very popular for a while just to say motivation is rubbish and discipline is everything. And I, I don't know, I don't yeah. know, man. Like it's, because I, I, I think this was um, Paris's point. So I remember saying to him, it was, he, he was on one of his Instagram stories. He was talking about hot takes. And I think that's the one I wrote in with. I said, um, yeah, motivation is actually very important. Discipline is is often sort of played up. But actually, you need both. So yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. have to enjoy what you do, for sure. Which takes us back to kind of the theme of what we've been talking about um, quite a lot today, which is sustainability and enjoyment mm. of what you're doing. Stay in the mm. gym. Just stay in the gym. So it, mm. It's a great hobby. I mean, just stay in the gym. Mm-hmm. And I think also, like, I think it's very, I never really thought of it, like, so far that way. But I think you're right, because when it comes to, like, you know, the Jocko Willings, the Goggin types, they, the way they frame what they do is very negative. They think, like, no one wants to do this. This fucking sucks. Like, no oh, one wants to wake up at this time. It, yeah. it sucks. And then it's just like, you know, it's like, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. But I do it anyway. And that's what's supposed to be empowering. And it's just like look about like look at like the people we looked up to it's like you know arnold for example he literally i'm coming like like every like 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 whenever he goes to the gym so like yeah um that is like a huge difference just like i want to do that too like like, being a young man that's all we want to do so like um getting out of that from the gym too like the way they frame what they do is also very different so i think that's important like you know choose who you listen to wisely because like you know that's that uh, common sentiment like you know you are who you surround yourself with mm. nowadays we are very like interconnected outside of just like our immediate circle so mm. um the stories we listen to uh like the idols we have and things of that nature they can now extend past our location and our uh time so for me like i'm a huge rocky fan like like i will like I would essentially like rewatch the Rocky series and calibrate my own thinking with those stories to kind of see if I'm like living up to uh, an idol or an idea that I like a lot. So now like we can do that like, like way better now than we could like ever before in human history. So, um, you know, be very careful to who you listen to. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally yeah. agree. So next question comes from HTG41. Uh, Thoughts and ideas for high-frequency training uh, five to six times per week. Um, so with high-frequency training, do you when you read that, do you think um, like high-frequency, like the same muscle like uh, for that much? Or do you think like the overall split is that five to six times per week mark? Yeah, I think, I think the same muscle. I mean, I, I can answer this one pretty confidently. I'm doing it right now. Mm. So uh, it is yeah, currently I love to hear it. Yeah, it's currently Wednesday as we're recording this. I've trained full body three times already this week. Um, mm. Heavy day, a light day, medium day. Um, I'm a huge fan of high frequency training. Um, now, uh, and, and I've done it in both ways. I've done it for bodybuilding, but also for powerlifting. But mm. specifically just talking about bodybuilding for now, that was my first experience of high frequency training. Round about 2007 was my first introduction to, to bodybuilding style training after training powerlifting for like eight years. Um, now i think it's it's great i think there are let's talk about advantages first but rather than talk about the drawbacks and how we set it up um i think advantages which are underrated is people always complain about the sessions being hard because you require a lot of warm-up time in my experience if you're training every day you end up requiring less warm-up time mm. you you tend to be in a heightened state of readiness a little bit more than you would be normally so yeah that's that helps when you're warming up for sessions um you're just you're just more primed to go um the second in terms of advantages is i think you can it's very good for the muscles because as long as the the muscles tend to recover quite quickly i think the more advanced you are 
the more often you can train and the, the quicker the recovery is. Um, so that means you can hit a body part up to six days a week, which is not that unusual for smaller body parts like say side delts and, uh, and biceps. But actually, if you vary things enough, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, you can do that for larger body parts with good effect. Um, so I think there are, yeah. And so it, it causes, in my experience, very good, robust um, strength and muscle gains. I also think if you're working full body multiple times a week, it's very good for um, burning calories. It's um, mm. it, You get a lot of glucose disposal because you're constantly like emptying your glucose to stores, at least partially, and then you fill them up as you eat. So it's quite good for your health in that respect. Um, and it's very anabolic because you're basically always signaling the muscle to grow and mm. repair. You're in that heightened state of growth and repair all the time, just to a lesser extent systemically than you would be with body part splits or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of advantages. I, and I think it's a great way of accumulating a lot of useful volume. Um, so I'm a, I'm a really, really big fan. And I think if you set the days up correctly, and I'm biased towards setting them up in heavy, light, medium way, I think that's the best way without a shadow of a doubt. Because I think then you get heavy days, which are very, very good for strength and hypertrophy, sandwiched in between lighter days and medium days where you get that systemic recovery. Mm -hmm. I will rally against people who like to split up the heavy lifts across multiple days per week. So I've seen the way I think Jeff Nipper does it, where he does yeah. like a squat one day and Eric Helms, a squat one day, a deadlift the next day and another day a front squat. And I just think, I just don't think he's really ran the split properly because essentially you have a heavy, heavy loading day every single day of the week for the hips, which is horrendous for recovery because you're limited always by your joint structures. You're never limited mm. by your muscles. You're limited mm. by your joints all the time. Your joints, your ligaments are what take longer to recover. The idea when it comes to heavy light medium is that you use those light days and medium days to actually enhance your recovery from the heavy days. The medium days and heavy days are the big hitters. So mm. you utilize the lighter days to enhance recovery. It's not dissimilar to Alpha Destiny's two day split where he does two heavy full body days and in between he sandwiches like body weight workouts and mm. rehabilitation type stuff. Mm -hmm. I made a video ages ago now um, analyzing Alex's program and I gave him a lot of credit for that because whereas he uses body weight exercises and high repetition tricep pushdowns and stuff to sort of promote recovery in between heavy sessions, I use light sessions, which I think I'm a bias, but I think it's a, it's a, it's another good way to answer the same problem. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's the best, a better way, but there you go. But essentially, the good thing is we've both identified a problem. We've come up with our own solution. For me, it's light workouts. For him, it's like, you know, higher calisthenic stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's so much I could say on, on full body, heavy, light, medium, but it's a great, and I think to make the days very different, you have to pull out all the stops, especially if you want to train high frequency. It, it doesn't matter if you're doing, say, three days a week of training. Mm -hmm. Heavy, light, medium is very easy to recover from. But if you're trying to train five or six days a week, you have to really pull out all the stops. And what yeah. I mean by that is you have to manipulate exercises, rep ranges, and rest periods. I'm a big believer that if you, if you manipulate rest periods, that is an added dimension, a very powerful dimension for introducing more variety because... Heavy bench presses with three minutes rest for sets of five is a completely different stress from cable crossovers for sets of 20 with a 45 second rest the yeah. day after. You, it's possible to do both. And if anything, while the cable crossovers give you some muscle growth stimulus, they're also going to enhance recovery mm -hmm. from the Monday so you can go again on the Wednesday. But I think as soon as people hear, I, I, I know in my experience, rep ranges and exercise selection, people are a lot more willing to uh, entertain. But as soon as you mention shorter rest periods, people go absolutely nuts because they go, ah, actually, you need three minutes because blah, 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 I said so. It's mm -hmm. like, well, no, understand the purpose of doing this within the context of the routine. If you're looking to train high frequency, variety is your friend. And because you're bodybuilding, like I've said before, earlier on in this, in this podcast, hypertrophy is a very forgiving endeavor. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this for ages, but love high frequency training. Mm -hmm. uh, the book that I wrote was called The Wizard. And that details how I did it and how I expanded from a basic three-day heavy light medium to like mm -hmm. six days. Um, I'm going to rename that book at some point. I'm going to, I'm going to just call it 
high frequency bodybuilding training. Um, oh, and, and uh, stop I thought you're gonna like level up and be like the sorcerer or like Merlin <laughs> or something. I was like, I was like, oh, sick! Like, <laughs> but, new armor and everything. Yeah, like, new armor and everything. You should be like laughing with a hood and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A bigger staff. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I, like, cause like, I remember when I was working with you with the <laughs> basically like, you know, following that tactician outline, like I did mm. notice all of those same benefits as you mentioned, like, cause I was thinking about it recently cause I'm, I'm, so there's a couple of different habits I'm trying to build up right now for, because like, you know, I'm cutting, there's certain habits I want to like have in place in my life um, that are just going to be like, you know, maintained for quite a while um, after talking with you and especially uncle freak, freaky D um, like, there's a lot of things that I'm just like, all right, cool. Like, it might be to my detriment, but I don't like necessarily care um, because I've also kind of rationalized other things. So for example, first I want to get into the habit of like morning cardio every day. Right. So, you know, mm. whether that be a run, whether that be like some other type of training, like, you know, my martial arts training is pretty cardiovascular intensive because I, um, whatever. And then, uh, or just the elliptical for an extended amount of time, but that's mm. like every single day, every morning, that's, that's going to be the base. And then later on in the day, like, um, like like around like that 12 to 1 so i'm trying to get that like cardio session done like around like 7 a.m and then around like 12 and 1 that's when i'll do i'll hit the weights yeah um and i'm really just trying to get that habit down first but i was also thinking like well when i go back to the weight section should i just do my usual training right now or um or should i just like make some adjustments when i because i am like trying to cut down and whatnot and it is totally unnecessary for me to make a lot of changes in my training to accommodate the fact that I'm cutting, like, you know, the things that helped build muscle and build strength are going to be very useful in uh, maintaining it. However, that's not the only change I'm making in my life. I'm also, um, this, this added amount of cardio, which is around that 40 minutes to 60 minutes. That's another stress on my body. So, um, trying to just maintain my my the current workload where a lot of my hard training was done exclusively with the weights i found that to be like very difficult to do so i did make some minor adjustments and one of them is high frequency training so um the way my split is kind of right now it's like let me actually pull it up it's like in my notes right now so let's <laughs> uh, let's see where is it at <laughs> would you with, with the cardio would you consider just doing like a, a walk in the morning, which would kind of serve to be relaxing as well as cardio. Um, I've thought about that as well. Um, but for me, I want to, so there, there's certain things I'm considering in my career that will require, um, and I'll talk to you about this, like after, um, there, that would require like a higher level of conditioning. Ah, gotcha. So as a result, it's like, I kind of need um, to have it be yeah. away from walking. So it's just uh, kind of like that. But yeah, basically the split is kind of like a like squat, bench, pull-ups, and then deadlift, dumbbell bench, and then rows. And then mm. and then the, um, after a couple of days, like I kind of do every other day with a split like that. And then there's a, another day where it's overhead press, dips, um, lat pull-downs, and tricep work. Mm -hmm. And then like a bro day like somewhere along there. But it's like every other day in the weights, but cardio is every day. Um, gotcha. So the thing is, while I know that's very different from my current um, bout of training, or at least that's what I've been doing for the past um, year and whatnot, I'm also kind of comforted in that strength will come back very quickly after a cut. And, and, and there might be some muscle loss because I'm using somewhat different exercises um, because I'm going to get neurally adapt to like, especially the dumbbell bench, because that's something I haven't done like too long. Um, but even if there is some amount of muscle loss, same thing. Once I return to, uh, like, once I start increasing the dosage and return to like a style of training that I like prefer, essentially, um, I'm going to get a lot of my strength and muscle back immediately. So yeah. as long as I present the stimulus to my muscles, especially the ones that will most notably take a hit, like squats and deads do a great job at maintaining lower body size and strength. Oh yeah. But mm -hmm. for bench, that's the thing that will take um, a big hit. So I'm just like, all right, cool. I'm going to bench barbell bench two times a week and I'm going to dumbbell bench uh, two times a week also. So that way it justifies the higher frequency without, mm -hmm. cause like a lot of people, they just, when they go into higher frequency, they immediately just like, you know, as you mentioned, um, present this high level of stress on the body yeah. and um, whether that be your hips or whether that be your shoulders or your chest, like you need to be very, precise in how you actually increase that frequency so if you are entertaining like let's say high frequency bench which is what most people like think about don't do don't increase the volume you're doing so let's say you're doing 10 sets per week 
split that up over four sessions or five sessions rather than trying to do like you know three sets each because you're already doing a three set per um, bench workout every time you hit bench and then maybe even do variations so like as i'm doing i'm doing dumbbell on some days or and then for someone else that might be dumbbell machine mm. um so that's kind of how i'm going about things like uh, are you right gonna now. go sub max on the barber lifts or yeah allow? sub max so, uh, yeah, sub max cool. yeah excellent yeah. that's a good point yeah Yep. So that's kind of like that, but like a yeah, high frequency training, especially full body training. Like honestly, when it comes to hypertrophy, I do gear people more toward a full body approach. It might mm -hmm. not be 100% full body, but like it is uh, more full body than it is like, let's say an upper lower. I find people are very hesitant, you know, with full body because mm -hmm. they just think the heavy day is going to suck. Yeah. Um, but you, you grow accustomed to it very, very quickly. I find it. So, um, mm -hmm. I know for you, you, you'll just do it like that. You know, you'll be, you'll, <laughs> you'll be a machine, but I, I tend to find with clients, it can be a hard sell. So mm -hmm. I do more often than not, I go with an upper lower, but my personal preference is still high frequency bodybuilding training. If you can train four times a week, train full body, cause you just get a great growth stimulus, very mm -hmm. high frequency. Uh, I, I really like it. And I think that undulation between heavy and light workouts is tremendous. So yeah, yeah, like you were saying, the other way to do it is to just vary the intensity. So if you are going to bench a couple of times a week, that's fine. But then just go with the, like a slightly lower intensity, which I think works great too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So next question, another one from Paladin Dance. What is the best body fat range to stay in during cut and bulk cycles? I'm probably not the best person to ask this. I have theories, but <laughs> you have experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th I think it's individual. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's individual because I, so I think your experience is very valid. Um, I think it is whatever body fat allows you to stay comfortable. Like I'll fully admit, I, if we were to compare someone, like say me to um, Jeffrey, mm -hmm. I'm definitely fatter than Jeffrey in the off season. And that's just because as a former fat kid, I'm not comfortable with being in that 10 to 20% range. So I will be a little bit fatter. Like right now, I'm in roughly the 18% range and I've been dieting for a little while. So you know, I was probably about 25. So right now I've got like an outline of abs when I tense. That's mm -hmm. much closer to like 16 to 18% body fat than it is to, you know, w whatever else. So, but a genuine, a genuine for me, I think 15 to 25% is pretty good. And bear in mind, that's, that's pretty lean, you know, for most people, for the average person. And I, mm -hmm. it's something that I can be happy with. I'm comfortable. My health is good, all that kind of stuff. If I was to try and bounce between 10 to 20, getting below 15% for me is a big push. You know, it's a big effort. Yeah. It's not, my body tends to gravitate towards higher ranges. So to answer the question, I mean, also, I, I do know this lad. He does stay quite lean. He's messaged mm. me before. He's DM'd me. He does tend to stay quite lean. So it's a case of what do you feel comfortable with? Because the last picture he sent me, I wouldn't feel comfortable like that year round. I would want to be a little bit fatter. Um, mm. It's a case of what you feel comfortable with, your own personal tolerance, and then obviously what your doctor says as well. You know. Um, mm. well, so what? So what are your thoughts on that? Because I think that you know that probably encompasses you know your preferences as well, right? Oh, definitely. Because even when I was in the military, like, and there was a lot of incentive to get a lot smaller. Um, it was very difficult to do so. So yeah. even like, despite the mileage that I was putting in, like with running, um, and despite all the like training that I was putting myself through in the, um, like after my work day, um, it was very difficult to get below a certain amount. And I would just feel miserable trying to diet below a certain point. Um, so when it comes to most people, I kind of like they want to get that like that sub like sub 10 sometimes and even like you know below 15 percent and i kind of ask them like why for what purpose like because mm. um if it's for they just want to look like that year round i typically tell them well first and foremost like let, let's let me see what um you think is uh, a good body to maintain year round and they'll show me a physique like you know um like brad pitt and troy or something like that and i was like you know that's pretty reasonable at you know these body fat percentages too and that's way more sustainable than because then i'll show them a picture of like this is what that number looks like and um the amount of effort that you'll take for that will last you about a month before you just start hating your life um yeah. and uh it's sometimes just a matter of managing their expectations and like really getting them to think about what it is exactly they're wanting and why they want it um so as far as like the best body fat range to stay in i think comfort is a really big thing yeah. uh, because people should also because like comfort also extends out to that bulk part as well like at what point are you uncomfortably big or do you not 
for me, it was pretty damn high. It was around that, like, you know, that 30, 40 mark where I was just like, yeah, I really don't like this. Should have had a, a bigger wall toward that upper extreme. Always have that because, like, you know, a dreamer book is fun, quite honestly. Like, it's a growing experience, quite literally. <laughs> so, um, it's something that typically what I like tell most people, and it's not going to be like, you know, 10 and 20. Like, some people extremely good even above that certain amount because he recomped for so long and he was at that high body fat percentage for so long but he still had very visible abs very visible yeah. definition so um it's very clear that he can like hang around those um, higher body fat percentages and still be very impressive uh, but other people and then this might change throughout your yearly like or not yearly but this might change throughout your lifetime because you're going to have ideally more muscle at each different stages of your life so um that's kind of like my thought there yeah i mean i was just going to add one more final point to that which is kind of what you touched at, at the end well remember that ultimately you are a, a bodybuilder you're a physique enthusiast what's going to make you look better is more muscle on your frame so don't like hamstring your long-term progression by just having this like unnatural focus on the diet and trying to fit into a mold which maybe doesn't suit you just be comfortable with, like like nh is a great example of this you know great guy great example of this his body weight does gravitate towards being higher even though he started off very light so as a result he did a three-year recomp which is a great plan for guys like him and guys like me mm -hmm. um and that meant that he was able to just slowly whittle away but the focus was still on the muscle gain because there's no point wasting years of your training life just trying to get down to certain body fat because to fit into a mold and especially i know your audience is, is generally a lot a lot younger than mine so just make sure you still have your eyes on the actual goal which is to gain muscle you you're always going to look better with more muscle in your frame than without mm -hmm. so don't hamstring that get your muscle build your muscle before you're 30 you know build a lot of it I mean, look at guys mm -hmm. like um name dropping like crazy <laughs> this is a fun <laughs> but, but again look at paris he's like mm -hmm. what, 200 pounds now something like that something 18 like that, inch yeah. 18 inch mm. neck the guy's uh, massive it's looks massive insane ridiculous you know mm. and he can carry a bit of body fat and he looks absolutely awesome and that's what mm. i found as well like carrying a bit of body fat now I, I'll, I'll be on the beach in a few weeks and i am carrying a bit more body fat and you know i've got no problem with that because i've got traps i've got delts everything and mm. all that so it's all good mm. it's all good i still clearly look like i work out so it's get your muscle you don't have to look like z's or whoever is the current um lean skinny guy is it alex eubank I think so. I'm very removed from that look now. So, like, get, get me being relevant. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So get your muscle. Get your muscle is my point. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think it's funny. Like, this is just a nerdy detour. Like, have you ever played the board game Risk? Or, yes. like, oh, I love that uh, board yeah. game. So, if you really want to like win in that game, you don't turtle like for the re for the entire game like yeah. you're you, you're actively at a disadvantage if you just turtle and stay at a specific body weight or trying to hold on to a certain body fat percentage for yes like people in this like if you really want to make a difference in what you can do how good you look and all these other things you have to uh, be willing to grow expand put yourself out there and really um, manage these things and obviously you don't just like send all your troops into battle you mm. you like have a plan and things of that nature but you also don't just stay where you're at like so like recomping is it's a honestly this is like just my point i think recomping should only be used for fat people <laughs> like myself or if like people coming from a, like a bigger side yeah, like i mean that i think that's a fair point you know i think that's a fair point it, it's a good strategy because i think if you if you aren't like you said for people like us if you aren't that comfortable with getting down to 15 percent via a diet then mm. yeah recomp's a great idea nh showed it it's a mm. great idea. So that probably describes quite a lot of my clients, my audience. They tend to be on the larger side. And a recomp for those guys is okay because sometimes they're just sick of dieting. So it's mm. okay. Like I've got a guy on the books now, Jamin, who's come down from 275 to now I think 230. So he's lost nice. a good amount of weight. And we're now really placing a great emphasis on training. I mean, we were before as well, but more training now because we're trying to maintain about 230. We don't really mm. want to go down low because it's just too painful you mm. know, for him. He's, he's just not able to. So let's let's focus on building some muscle and just improving body composition. So I think what you said there about recomp being more for fatties is probably a good idea because it's a nice way to whittle down the body fat while still maintaining the bigger, more important focus, which is getting yoked.
Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So next question, another one from Paladin Dance. Love the questions, my guy. Uh, what are the best alternatives to the barbell back squat, barbell bench press, and deadlifts for muscle growth? Um, you want to start fast? Ah, uh, wow. It's a, it's a very general question, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's going to be one of those where it's what works for you and also contextual. I mean, I think if you're a beginner and your form is pretty good on those lifts, then they're great lifts, you know? Yeah. They're, they're very general lifts, they're very good lifts. Um, if you're not able to perform them safely, then maybe something which is more machine-based, which, mm. which essentially locks you into form. So, for example, um, I have a beginner at the gym at the moment who actually goes to my gym, weirdly enough. Um, he is quite weird, actually. He found me through youtube but he goes to my gym at it just at a different time so uh, we've never it's we've it never like crossed paths first, but it was my first like mini celebrity moment i was like oh wow so pretty crazy <laughs> so anyway i've got him doing a pendulum squat but also a hack squat because mm. his squat form isn't that great so mm. that works because he's able to get good depth he's able to load safely he feels good on his joints that's all good so i think it, whatever allows you to train safely productively in that you know uh, in the same vein as as these lifts, um, yeah, I think it's what I, I, I'm not a I'm not a sort of a barbell max list, maximalist. So I just mm. think whatever allows you to train safely with those movement patterns, and I'd say I might even lean on the machines being superior for beginners, just because you don't have the learning curve that a lot of these barbell lifts do. You don't have that stabilization. Because, I mean, I don't know if you remember way back when the first time you ever bench press, first time I bench press, the ball was all over the place. I was like, we're yeah. like crazy, right? You don't get that with a machine chest press. So mm. for a lot of beginners, I will just stick them onto machines and get them mm. nice and strong and then potentially move into barbell lifts when they feel ready. So um, definitely beginners, I know, I know Paladin Dance isn't a beginner, um, you know, but there are loads of variations in the gym, right? So mm. I think whatever you've, and also I will say, here's one more thing I want to say before we move, but before, before I let you speak, sorry. There's one more thing I want to say is the, the quest to find the best alternative, the most optimal exercise is fucking nonsense. Can we stop with that? Because you're never just going to do one exercise. It's like, it's like back in the day, people used to ask questions about, oh, if you could only do one lift for the rest of your life, leg press or squat, what you do? What mm -hmm. in what world does that make any kind of sense? Mm -hmm. We need to stop looking for optimal because the very notion is flawed because you're never going to do one lift. You're mm -hmm. always going to rotate lifts. You're never going to do, you know, one lift for the rest of your career. You're going to rotate things. You're going to go back and forth. So it's not about that. It's, it's, it places too much importance on exercise selection when that's mm -hmm. not that important. It's Have true. a good run, make some gains feel free to move on to other alternatives and get more gains. These are all mm. tools in your toolbox. So I don't, I don't really like the question. I, I answered it from a beginner's point of view, but mm. moving outside of the beginner status to intermediate and advanced, I don't really like the question for our because it, it, is, it has a bias towards their being a best, their being an optimal yeah. when there isn't. So I don't even like Paladin Dance. I don't even like your question, bro. Because <laughs> yeah. like my, my answer was going to be, um, why are we looking for alternatives like that is the first question i ask like to um because i do get clients it's like well i don't want to do this and like whatnot. not so it's like why not well it's just, i'm not that good at it and then i'll kind of ask them like have you tried it a hundred more times like because you put in more time into it you get better at it and then like we'll kind of figure out like even after all that right and i just realized i skipped the question so black john i'm sorry we're gonna uh, uh oh, yeah. tag back um but he kind of he mentions the epo protocol which is like my my uh like how I structure training and basically the base of it, like the, like the main focus of it is basically four exercises, right? A main lift, a supplementary lift and two accessories. Like, mm -hmm. I think if a person structures their training, like their training days with at least that, they're probably on the right path. And when it comes to like main lift, supplementary lift, you know, it doesn't have to be barbells. Of course, I'm not as att um, attached to the barbells as I was previously, but mm -hmm. it's a, damn good idea to do that so let's say with squats right for your main lift it's a barbell like a high bar barbell squat like if if muscle growth is the goal for you a high bar is going to be slightly better and even better than that is like with your heels elevated or maybe with the ssb and then heels um heels elevated as well like some type of free weight squat and then your supplementary lift leg press hack squat you don't limit yourself to exclusively the barbell and especially for beginners because I, when I think about like beginner training versus intermediate and advanced with beginners, the barbell lifts 
are almost exclusively skill work. You are not building up nearly that much muscle because it's just not that heavy. You're mainly building the balance, the coordination, and the skill of actually lifting with the barbell. But when it comes to the supplementary lift where those factors are removed, you're now challenging the muscle quite well. And then when you go back into the next session with that same lift, you're improving your abilities because you have an exercise that improves your muscle, um, muscle and strength, and then you have something where your skill gets better. And as a result, over time, when you get more intermediate, you actually get more out of your squats. You get more out of your deadlift because now there's the sufficient loading. And then there's also good technique that will keep you safe, keep you progressing. And that's kind of why the main lift, supplementary lift, at least to, in my mind, makes a lot of sense. And then the accessories and whatnot are important because if you want to maximally build the muscle, you don't use one exercise. You need to have um, multiple. You need to have um, a lot of different big hitters. So my general philosophy is like every muscle should have a big three so um for delts for myself it's overhead press upright rows and lateral raises like i think that um that will take care of it pretty well because for the rear delt a lot of my pulling exercises is rowing so my rear delts are taken care of a lot from that but having that kind of approach and what you'll notice there is none of those things are alternatives they are supplemental. They add to it. Like alternatives is a mindset of replacing things. And replacements should be made on a basis of, let's say, injury or honestly, that's the main thing that comes to mind. Like and uh, anthropometry is probably another good one. Like you're just not built for it, quite honestly. But a lot of people will assign themselves that status before they put any meaningful amount of time uh, with certain positions or skill sets or technique or training. Because some people I know, or some people I've trained, they've convinced themselves they can't hit depth. And I've, and I sympathize with them because like, you know, I suck at squatting quite a lot. But at the same time, I never once thought of myself as being disqualified from becoming a good squatter, because there's just no reason for me to believe that. Like, if I'm willing to put in the work necessary to improve like the position and whatnot, I should be able to get better also. And just trying to get them through that mindset. It's like, don't run away from the thing you're bad at. Like you don't have to like only focus on that thing and hyper fixate on it either, but actively neglecting it will only make you worse, not better. Yeah. I mean, I think to your, to your point where, where I agree with you, I'd say um, the barber lifts do give us objective standards, which is important, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, if you like frequently people will change gyms they'll move house they'll move city and they'll change gym so you always know where you are with the barbell so that allows for the continuation of progress because you can compare whereas if you have a leg press at one gym and that's your main exercise and you you try and go to a different gym you can't really compare so i think there's that um but i would say i'm probably more i've moved more away from barbells than i think you have so i and that probably comes from the experience of spending years away from the barbell lifts like mm -hmm. i haven't I haven't seriously, well, I've only recently started benching again. I've benched, I think, twice now um, over the last couple of weeks. And prior to that, I haven't benched for about three or four years. Mm. So I've spent a long time away from the barbell lifts, having done them for decades. Mm. Um, and if that's reflected in my clients' programs as well. What I would generally try and do is I generally try and get them to identify gyms, uh, sorry, uh, machines at the gym they're at which they can improve on so like mm -hmm. to give you my example um for my shoulders there is a seated viking press there is a hammer strength seated press and there is this really nice machine shoulder press at my gym so those three are like my shoulder lifts which i judge my progression on mm -hmm. and if i'm getting stronger on those then that's all, not one of those is a barbell lift or even dumbbells. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my trio, um, simply because I like the groove. It, it, it feels pretty good. And so I get people to identify, um, a, a, like yourself, a trio of, of lifts, but they tend to be what's available in the gym. And so we just mm -hmm. try and have goals for those lifts. Like I know with the lying chest press that I do at my gym, I want four plates aside. That's my kind of like long-term goal kind of thing. So it's, it, it still allows people to improve, but I don't. I don't have the same sort of reliance on the barbell mm. uh, as, as as you do, and as I used to as well. I used to be a lot mm. more into insisting people will squat, squat, and get better at squatting. And for a long time, I share. I very much shared your point of view. I remember having these arguments with people like five years ago, and saying, "Well, if you can't squat very well, I can teach you." You know, um, but I've I've sort of stopped 
doing that. And that might be an artifact of me being more, mostly an online coach and you being more in person where you can, you know, guide them into doing things potentially better. Whereas I find, although I can teach people how to barbell squat, even online, I think it's, I don't really want the conversion time. If mm. somebody's with me, they've signed up, then I need to get the results ASAP. So typically I don't mind foregoing a squat or a bench press if they're not very good at doing it just mechanically like via form mm. and i'll just stick them on like a leg press or a chest press and off we go um we're, but i i don't think either i mean i'm not saying that approach is better but that's kind of where i've gone to for that reason i do think mm. there's some value in what you're saying mm. so i'm not not disagreeing i think there's value mm. in what you're saying because the argument that i used to say was well if you can learn how to squat better that will transfer over to every um quad knee flexion exercise you do like you'll get better at leg presses you'll get better at hack squats pendulum squats everything if mm -hmm. you just, so i i i think there's a lot of value in what you're saying it's mm -hmm. just not the route that i currently take because i would rather just cut my losses and let's say let's get straight into it because we're probably going to be cutting we're probably going to be bulking and so we need the muscle stimulus yeah definitely and like i will admit like you know like there was a question like what changed the barbell lift part of that main um exercise slot has shifted a lot for me like there are clients of mine who like you know like you mentioned like leg press and hack squats i would just say well which one is the one that is like strictly like you know um the one you want the most amount of like strength improvement on or most improvement in this rep range and then this one is like more so for volume which one like well can you recover from better so there's a recovery aspect to like like that whole main and supplemental at least in my like, thought process with things but i definitely think that um my biases are still relevant like uh, prevalent they're still present in a lot of my decision making but it's also i think forgiven because most of the people who like sign up for my coaching have that same bias yeah and right yeah. only the only the ones who like don't have that bias i like will i like say like well we don't even need to do that but you, most of the time they're like well i want like i want to do this thing so um that's that's another thing i want to point out for the listener and then yeah, and I, I think and again to your credit i think there's a hell of a lot of positive in just like slogging away at five by five on a bench press and just go you know you know going through that sort of initiation period of just mm -hmm. gutting your life out at a five by five adding weight to the bar eating your food getting your recovery right and just and going through that trial of fire, which you have to do to get from beginner to intermediate, I think there's a hell of a lot of positive in that. And like, mm -hmm. we can't intellectualize our way out of hard work. So I, to your mm -hmm. point and to, to your method, I, I do think there's a lot to be said for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, so next question, Black John, sorry for skipping over you. How to incorporate calisthenics in the off days and use them as feeder sets, preferably in a every other day training program like the EPO protocol. So yeah. I'll probably leave this one to you because I'm not that hot on calisthenics. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you crack on, yeah. <laughs> so this is my experience with calisthenics is very limited as well um like i love pull-ups dips i'm slowly integrating push-ups again because most people who have ever gone through the military will just absolutely hate running and push-ups by the time they're done um because <laughs> like, the amount of times that we are like obviously in basic training you're like <laughs> you do a shit ton of push-ups because they have to smoke you um mm -hmm. i think a bit less nowadays because they're not allowed to smoke you as hard or something like that um <laughs> but uh and then also just like the sheer I, I was in the army and we had pt every single day so um in other branches of the military uh like they don't meet for pt at like literally in the early ass like uh morning so they do like PT on their own. So physical training on their own, like, but in the army at 6 AM, you better be in formation because you're going to do a shit ton of push ups, You're going to do a lot of sit-ups and you're going to go for a run. Um, and that's every single day, Monday through Friday. The only times you have that off is like on federal holidays. So when it comes to incorporating calisthenics, the, the difficult thing for me is what are we kind of talking about here? Because there's the skill aspect of calisthenics where you're doing like things like planches, L sits, things of that nature. And, if it's that kind of calisthenics, I have absolutely zero idea. But when it comes to basic movements, push-ups, pull-ups, inverted rows, uh, body weight squats, lunges, uh, sit-ups even, you do not need to worry nearly as much because I find it very difficult to even present your body a, um, a sheer no amount of stimulus through that kind of calisthenics, unless you start weighting it, of course where you're going to notice a decrease in performance. You might experience some aches and pains just by the sheer volume of things. Um, and at that point, it's just a matter of um, trial and error, quite honestly. 
But when it comes to those basic exercises, especially if you're doing them unweighted, you are not going to notice nearly as much of a detriment to your performance because I was doing that every single day. But on top of like all those, the cardio and whatnot, my strength training was still, and my muscle building training was still able to progress quite nicely. So I don't think that if it's purely body weight, like not a lot of load added basic exercises, you're more than likely going to be fine. And another example of this is Alex Leonidas. If you look back to his older videos, he does have videos where it's just like uh, high volume push-ups and pull-ups every single day. If yeah. you um, look at like a lot of his specialization, it was toward calisthenics and it was mainly the more rep-based stuff, not the uh, skill-based stuff. So that's kind of like where my thought process is. Yeah, I mean, just just on that note, I think there's a lot to be said for building out the the base of physical preparedness with calisthenics and lighter exercises daily in a similar way to in the cardiovascular world if you follow a guy called um, joel jameson he very much push he's an mma coach conditioning coach mm. he very much pushes this idea of long distance cardio to improve sports like mma which are very sort of like um, um but explosive bursts of sport uh, of power because he believes that that builds a great engine for higher cardiovascular capability and shorter bursts. So I think it's kind of the same with um, bodybuilding training. We've kind of gotten away from building the base. And yeah. like I know for, my, for myself, my best body parts were built via playing lots of soccer, like lots of football. Um, so it built a base when I was younger. And as a result, it transferred very well to the, uh, the weight room. So yeah, I like the idea of a lot of exercise. I My preference is to do it via the heavy light medium method. But yeah, uh, yeah I think calisthenics, it, like I was saying earlier, I think it solves the same problem. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. I think we just have one more. <laughs> All right, so this one comes from Supreme Destiny, Alpha Destiny's uh, older cousin. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, leg training for tall dudes. So 6'3 um, and above, wonderful. Uh, managing systemic fatigue and saving the lower back. Particularly, is it okay to minimize compound movements one to two sets, two times a week, and add more volume through isolation, machines, higher up ranges on bodybuilding lifts. I appreciate both of you guys a lot. And have a good day. Yeah, that, that's very nice. Um, uh, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of like similar to what we've been saying. You and I might differ a little bit, but I guess similar to what we've been saying, I think if you're not a powerlifter, don't feel like you have to do the barbell lifts. Mm -hmm. you know? Don't. You might be okay on front squats, but um, don't feel like you have to squat. You know, if you. Mm -hmm. If you find it really hammering your lower back, move to a leg press. There's nothing wrong with that. You can always build up a lot of muscle with, say, stiff leg deadlifts, RDLs, good mornings, hyperextensions, and then lots of leg pressing, lots of belt squatting, mm -hmm. um, and then come back to the squat. You know, when you're a bit more jacked and you might find it an easier uh, mm -hmm. thing to do. You know, when you are a bit more, a bit more um, sturdy. Um, but if you really want to include the barbell lifts, then yes, something that I've done is to completely reduce. The barbell work and just make up the volume with other things which are more joint friendly like leg presses um there's there's one guy who i've coached recently and i've got him doing just two sets of squats per week that's all mm. once a week two sets and the rest of his quad training is all leg presses and belt squats and leg extensions it's mm. fine it satisfies his desire to squat because he mm. wants to do that um if it was up to me i i would just have him leg pressing and belt squatting i think it's fine but he, he likes to do the squat so yeah i would just say to, to you, um, you don't have to do the barbell lifts um, if if your goal is just physique. But mm. if you do have a fondness, that's how I have done it, and I do do it with clients, and it works fine. Definitely, yeah. I, I'm pretty much in the same uh, boat and agreement because when you are taller and have longer legs and things of that nature, squatting is more of a back exercise. So there's going to be a lot of that fatigue that comes about. Um, and I'm for a lot of people, like... One of my clients, I actually took out like a lot of like barbell bench and conventional deadlift because he doesn't have any desire for those lifts and doesn't right. have any like, uh, like he's not really getting much out of it. So, yeah. um, but he does love squatting and, but, but he's a taller guy as well. Heel elevation, front squats, like, like, and of course, volume management. That's kind of like what I do because I want to make sure that most of the force gets put onto the quads because mm -hmm. like, Otherwise, it does become like a halfway good morning. Um, and then when it comes to everything else, yeah, a lot of volume on leg extensions, uh, leg presses, high squats, pendulum squats, because um, it sounds to me like he's a bit more on that bodybuilder uh, mindset, like quite honestly. Uh, so I would like just bias more toward that. Like there's no, 
like my um, dedication to the barbell lifts is like until I actually step foot on the platform, it is purely arbitrary. I just love those lifts. That is the main reason why I keep them in my training throughout the yearly cycle, no matter what, and just find them to be fun. And, and I just, it, I manage the other variables to stay injury free, but I really love the barbell lifts. Um, and for, if someone doesn't have that same love for them, do what gets you results because that's probably why you're going to the gym. But I, I will say once again, just to your point, um, and just in, in credit to what you're saying in your strategy, a lot of times I noticed early on uh, when I was powerlifting, a lot of powerlifters made better progress than bodybuilders because they had like one objective standard to progress towards. Whereas mm. bodybuilders were doing little bits of everything in the gym, pumping, mm. toning, and not really focused on progressive overload. A lot of powerlifters were actually making really good muscle building progress because they had a focus. And that's I've said the same thing about my own training. So to your point, you know, the one thing about the barbells that you, uh, a 200 kilo squat is the same in England as it is in America. You know, it's, mm. it's an objective standard which you can improve on wherever you are. So, you know, I think there's a lot of good in that and we shouldn't throw that out completely. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable point. Hmm. What's 200 uh, kilos in uh, washing machines? <laughs> 440. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I just think it's hilarious. Like, I just like uh, how Americans like, like <laughs> our, our measuring system uh, needs work, but I also Cup, can't cups understand. Cups is what drives me nuts. Cups. cups like, what is, yeah. what is cups? Like what? Uh -huh. It's the weirdest measurement ever. Mm -hmm. A cup can be a different size. It can be a large cup, a medium cup. Like what are we talking <laughs> about? Is it a cup for your groin? What what, what mm -hmm. are we talking about? It makes no sense. <laughs> or yeah. like sometimes I, I mess up too. Like I will always make mistakes when it's like teaspoon versus tablespoon, and the only way to tell the difference is capital T or lowercase t. And like I'm just <laughs> yes. like, oh god. <laughs> are you guys are you guys moving more towards things like milliliters and meters, or are you still doing your freedom units? um freedom units mainly um it depends where you're at though because you're starting we are starting to see it with a lot of our like uh consumables so like, really? our, like ah, so, yeah like the soda bottles and like our ah. like food and whatnot it's starting to like trend that way um yeah. but when it comes to like the most important stuff like uh measuring distance and whatnot mm -hmm. that tends to be like very difficult because it would be super expensive to replace all of the road signs yes. because we have like one of the largest highway systems. We have like one of the uh, largest like road systems in the world. So it's just, we very... still use miles per hour. Yeah. 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 We, we do. So, yeah. Mm. And I think Canada also has like a hybrid thing as well. So, but right. you know, they, they do things funny, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that's a good place to cut it for right now. There's like 34 more questions because there's also the ones on Faz's channel. Um, but I have essentially run out of brain. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. You guys are gonna have to forgive us because it's been almost two hours. We, we, mm -hmm. we could maybe do that. If you, if this goes down very well, we could perhaps do that as a follow up. I, I would be happy for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, we could run through it nice and quick. So. Yeah, next one will be like a shot one. So I would love that a lot. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm not going to try my outro. I'm like so brain dead because like I've been doing nothing but uh, like social interactions and I'm very introverted. So like I am quite literally out of brain. So Faz, where can they find you? And uh, um, any closing remarks you want to say? Well, firstly, thank you again for having me on your channel, Corella. I always enjoy speaking to you. And yeah, hopefully we can do it again and maybe even make this a regular thing. I, I, I always enjoy our back and forth. So yeah, you can guys can find me predominantly on YouTube as Faz Lifts, um, also on pretty much any podcast station as Faz Lifts. And I generally tend to upload my YouTube videos there as well. But do subscribe to you on Faz Lifts. Also Instagram and TikTok now as well for mm. shorts and... Um, client testimonials, things like that. Mm. Um, and if you're interested in coaching, just contact me at any one of those places and we can chat. So yeah, no, uh, thank you again for having me on. Always a pleasure, man. All right, thank you so much. All right, everyone, have a great day.